The Baseball Together Network presents the Seattle Baseball Together Podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Julie Young. And now, Seattle Baseball Together. Welcome to this month's episode of the Seattle Baseball Together Podcast, Baseball Family. I am one of your co-hosts. My name is Brad. And as always, now this year, I'm joined by our guy, Jewel. Welcome, Jewel. How are you today? We are doing good in the neighborhood. Good in the hood. Excellent. Baseball family, thank you once again for joining us for this uh, this month's therapy session as Mariners fans. And you know, to be completely honest with you, Jewel, I was really coming into the season super optimistic. I was like, man, there's not going to be any downside. This isn't going to be therapy. This is going to be celebration every single month. But we're Mariners fans. Therefore, Jewel, it's therapy. <laughs> and therapy it is, even despite... A good start, like a solid start. A but very there are, solid there are some start. That we're going to address definitely. Um, as of today, as of today, it is April the 29th that we're recording this. The Mariners lost to the Miami Marlins in Miami today, eight to six, to fall to an eleven and nine record. Which I'm going to take it. I'm going to take yeah. it. Yeah, same. I'll definitely so, take it as well an outstanding start so today we're going to go through we're going to highlight every series that we've gone through in april we're going to give we're each going to give our best and worst of the month and uh we're going to share with you guys what we want to see from the mariners going forward in may and then we have a little bonus topic there at the end that we'll hit on um but jewel let's start let's start with minnesota so because of the lockout the mariners had to open the season on a trip to minnesota and chicago there are not two worse places to play in the country in the beginning of April than Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Chicago, Illinois, and the Mariners drew them both. Um, that, was, that was rough. That was real rough for both of them because the, the weather was horrendous in both those cities. Uh-huh. And I think it really got our... I got our entire pitching staff off to a really bad start, except Mm -hmm. Logan Gilbert. Robbie Ray didn't get off to too bad of a start. Not to too bad. His first couple of outings were a little rough between those two cities because he got he got both of the worst games of each of those series weather wise. Well, so he yes he did. So he yeah he got the really bad one in Minnesota. It was cold, but they still ended up winning that game two to one. And then his next start was uh, where to go? Why can't I find? Oh, he should have it been was... on one, two, three, four. He should have been on the opener for against the White Sox. There we go. It was the but second game. That one game. had like that one had like I remember that one had like freezing rain or something. Like it kept going like wet. Yeah, that was the dry. monsoon game. That was yeah. the monsoon game. Scott yeah, looked awful. out, looked out of the dugout, and he's looked at the umpire like, "What are we doing here? Like, come on!" And he's not wrong. You don't play baseball in that kind of weather. A, it's miserable. B, it's bad for the field and see it's unsafe and i'm and i mean that that i'm i put that at the end because that's legitimately the order (laughs) that major league baseball cares about things right yeah no it really is um but no outside of that that those first couple home road road trips minnesota chicago they were rough i mean a lot of it goes to cold weather lockout pitching like there's well, a lot hold of on. Hold, yeah, pitching pitching was big because those first two games you had Robbie Ray and then you had you had Logan Gilbert go those first two games. The Mariners locked those up. They won both those games. Mm-hmm. But then you go into Sunday against Minnesota and Marco, Marco Gonzalez got rocked. did not have a great game. He was not sharp. Um, gave up. I mean, the Mariners gave up 10 runs that game total. And yeah. we're going to get into Marco a little bit more, but it's it's been brutal so far. And then you had Chris Flexen, who has not been himself yet, uh, end up losing the game on Monday as well. So they they came out of Minnesota two and two, and it's kind of like okay, like Minnesota is a little bit better team than I think we were expecting. I think Carlos yeah. Carlos Correa fits in with that team. Yeah, and he's already talking. This is totally off topic for the Mariners, but he's already talking about how he wants to work on a long term deal there. Yeah, yeah, already. and I think. I honestly think like if Buxton stays healthy. They've got two of the best players in the game right there. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So, 
So no, the, no. the Twins could be a big surprise. I did not see them being this good. I legitimately thought the Correa went there straight up for the money. That was the only reason. But I think he saw something there. Kind of like how Machado went to San Diego and everybody laughed when yeah. he was like, no, I like the farm system. And it's like, yeah, the farm system where you're harvesting your money. But they I mean, turned into we, a really good team. Now we might even be seeing the same thing in Colorado with KB and that team. We, we might. They're a couple of years away from being San Diego and Minnesota, but it That's could be. That's true, but I mean, it's very similar. Very, very similar again. So Yeah, yeah, very similar. You're right. Um, so came out of came out of Minnesota a little bit. I felt a little bit shell-shocked after that series. They're like, oh boy, like either Minnesota's good or this Mariners team, and granted, four games, a little bit concerned that maybe they had more work to do than what we were initially expecting. Yeah. So then you go into the crap show that was Chicago for three days. Like we talked about, game two was those games those like a hurricane, losses, a frozen yeah. hurricane. <laughs> we were just on the wrong end of it. We just had the bad luck on those two games. Yeah, big time. Right. But then you've got that day game on, on Thursday, the one that Logan Gilbert pitched, mm-hmm. and you have gale force winds. They are saying that gusts were going to be up to 50 miles an hour oh, with yeah. sustained winds at 35. Did you get a chance to watch that game? I listened to it. It was insane. Gilbert still pitched a great game. He pitched an outstanding game, but the game itself was just absurd to watch. Like there was the Mariners got, of course, uh, there I think it was like the bottom of the fifth or the sixth. Mm -hmm. They got some bad, some I don't want to even call them hops, just some bad wind, right? Yeah. That there were two or three balls that never made it out of the infield, and the wind just wreaked havoc on the infield. Yeah. And the White Sox capitalized, which, you know what? That's what you expect to happen in those games. Yeah. It's going to happen to somebody. It's going to happen at some point. They just happen to be strung together, and they got their one run out of it. Yeah, and then the same thing happened on the Wednesday game in that series, too, where, I mean, the, the scripts kind of flip. That Tuesday-Wednesday game, all those, like, wind errors, the weather uh-huh. errors, all went to the White Sox in their favor. Yeah. And then... Thursday, the tide turned, and then we got it, so we came out of that series with a win. So we had, we yeah. took that series 2-1 one, or 1-2. One, you know, the Mariners, I will say the Mariners did benefit from the wind a little bit. There were a couple home runs that got up into the jet stream up there, and mm-hmm. they I don't know that they necessarily were carried out of the ball, out of the park because of the wind, but I'm sure it certainly helped. They were helped, yeah, definitely. You know, so. <laughs> I remember listening Absolutely. to it, and I was like, is it? Is it gonna go? Oh, it goes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the Mariners came out of Chicago with uh, with one. They they lost that series one to two, but then you go home. You go to home sweet home, and this is one of my big things this year already. Is that the Mariners for so many years, so 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 many years, have struggled to win games out. Mm-hmm. It's a problem but it doesn't seem to be a problem this year yet yeah no right? true no they were great on that friday game against the astros marco's home opener he was sharp the team was sharp jackie robinson day was sharp 11 to 1 that place was absolutely rocking like the jesse cameras winker were, the cameras were shaking jesse winker nicknamed t-mobile park the electric factory which i love every bit of that i would love for it to continue to be the electric factory throughout the season because this team is going to thrive a lot off of the energy that the fans provide Mm -hmm. and and they can go a long ways toward helping them establish winning streaks extend winning streaks overcome adversity late in the game we saw them do it last year we uh the mariners group that i'm in mariners nation on facebook everybody kept referring to the mariners as cardiac kids because that's exactly what they were they wouldn't do anything until like the seventh or eighth inning yeah and they're they're that way again this season and i know and i really don't want them to be (laughs) just get out to an early lead and hold it killing me yeah no they just like to play with their food a little too much they're they're young they like to play with their food (laughs) Exactly uh, what it is. And then, and then and it's then time we, to go to bed. They're like, okay, um, um, um. Uh, let right. me eat that, real quick. Yeah, uh, and then exactly they jump forward to that Saturday game, which I was at. I was at that Saturday game against the Astros. And that was a lot of Of course, you went to fun. the one where Verlander pitches. And yeah, it was it was awesome to see Verlander just completely dominate. I've been fortunate. The last two Mariner games I've gone to, last year one I went to, Zach Granke pitched against the Mariners. 
dominated them. This year, Justin Verlander pitched against them, dominated. But it's really cool being on the other end of that as just a baseball fan and seeing two Hall of Fame pitchers do their thing. Yeah, it's a big deal. So I went to we went to a day game here in Phoenix. Um, the the Dodgers were in town, and Urias pitched for the Dodgers. It was cool. Yeah, it's cool to get to see those guys pitch. It's a yeah, lot of fun. It was so, but then they lost that game 0 4. But like even being there, like at the stadium, when we had those times where we, you know, got runners in scoring position or certain players were up and, or just the situational baseball moments, like when they put those things on the on the reader board to like get loud or make some noise or anything like that, it got nuts. And I knew that going in. So I got both my kids, like the little like kid headphones, oh, the yeah. noise dampening ones. And yeah, they were great. That's awesome. So does it so I remember going to games when when Griffey and Ichiro were playing, uh, you know, as a teenager, and yeah. there was a buzz in the stadium. And same thing with A-Rod. When A-Rod went up, there was a buzz in the stadium. You could feel it. Is it the same way when guys like Julio Kelnick is it? I don't know if it's going to be the same way because there's a lowered expectation for him now. So I would but, definitely say when Wink went up, okay, because Hanniger didn't play this game, um, because that was the game he was out, of course, his first game <laughs> out with COVID. Um, COVID, okay. Definitely was there with Wink. It definitely was there with, um. Wasn't like there yet with like Wink and Suarez and whatnot. It was absolutely nuts for JP. Oh, he's a huge it went in Seattle. Absolutely nuts for JP. Like chicks around me, you know, Daddy <laughs> JP is a big deal. Daddy, Daddy JP. J- Daddy <laughs> JP. That's so funny. It's Daddy I JP. So, um, when that's for him, Julio definitely had some electricity. Um, Kelnick, meh. That's what I'm Very saying. The meh. expectations for him have dropped yeah. for him rather than like doing something spectacular and outstanding. It's like just just get on base, man. Yeah, you he know? had one of those hits where it's like one more month and he's hitting those just like six, seven. Yeah, yeah, I remember. He had one of those home series. runs and it was. It was so stressful because it was right there, and he would have gotten yeah. us back, like started again. Like that's when the game was probably like one or two to zero, and uh-huh. oh, it would have gotten us back in there. Just missed. Yeah, it. that's that's what I've noticed with Kelnick because everybody came. Everybody said he came in just like bulked up. I think it was Winker said that he looked like a running back just because he's he, a linebacker. Yeah, he's like he is just like so much more bulky, but at the same time, he didn't get a full spring training. So yeah, some of those balls early in the season they're not going to go yet. You still got to give it another month, and I'm I think once we get here, um, maybe I mean I think we're two weeks away from those. Yeah, I you think know? we're getting closer. I think his him and Julio are already starting to look better at the plate. They both have good discipline. Julio's okay. Let's talk about this real quick. Yeah, Julio has unmatched Julio. Dis- plate discipline. That guy's eye. He has either been working with Edgar Martinez or is he he is a flat out savant because well, he's one of those guys where I, I kid you not, Jewel. If Julio doesn't say it, say it's a strike, it's not a strike. Well, you know who else is like that on the team? Who's that? J- Jesse Winker. Exact, Jesse Winker. Yes. Exact same. Exact same. If it if he doesn't swing at it. Or he doesn't think it's a strike. It was it's, probably not a strike unless exactly. it's Angel Hernandez. Um, it's yeah. always a strike with Angel Hernandez. Exactly, but no, I agree. Like the Mariners, I think they're like a top like three team in the MLB in walks. They are because that's something that uh, that Depoto and Service have wanted to focus on. Especially, I mean, they've been talking about it for five years. Own the zone as yeah, a hitter. And, you need to own the zone, and that is plate discipline. That is that is the name of the game. And yeah. the Mariners were, they really struggled with it for a while. And last year when they had that nasty lose, like when they had that nasty month, I think it was in May, you know, getting mm-hmm. no hit yeah. twice, everything they mm-hmm. weren't, they were just up there hacking away at everything, but they fixed things when they got to be patient again and they were, they had better discipline. Yeah. When they're patient, they're great. And mm-hmm. 
and they all can work the count. Winker can go up there for a 15 pitch at bat, no problem, and get a single and be like, rock on, yeah. dudes. Uh, he better be getting singles. I want him. I want him to start hitting home runs, though. Uh, yeah. Winker. So, r- real quick before we move on to Winker, um, Julio Rodriguez has been getting absolutely jobbed at the plate. For those of you oh, who don't yeah. know, uh, he has been called out on what 18 strikeouts. Most, I think he has more backwards K's than than forward K's. Forward yeah, K's, yeah, he does. But of those, I want to say it's like 18 or 19. Of those, like 12 or 13 of them were balls. They were out of the zone. So it's like you got to give the kid a break. And but, the Mariners know, the Mariners yeah. know, right, that, like, yeah, those are balls. So they're not going to count it against them. They're not going to send him down to get right because he is no, right. He, he is, is right. right in the no, head. No, he is right. And then, But then when he does get on base, he, he steals dangerous. a base. He steals a base. He's, he's, <laughs> he's he is single-handedly going to bring back the art of making the stolen base cool again in baseball. I hope so. I hope so. I was joking I, with Brig. On the big show last week, that Julio's on on track to steal sixty bases and hit zero home runs, be the first guy in the history of Major League Baseball to do that. Shoot, I'll take it. How many of those home, how many too. of those stolen bases are turning into runs scored? Exactly right, exactly right. So many of them are, but uh, but the Mariners finally, finally on Thursday it came out that they sent a letter to Major League Baseball and said this is getting to be freaking ridiculous. Yeah. That this guy is getting called out on these balls and service. I thought he was going to get tossed yesterday. He, he was did. irate. He, he didn't did. get tossed. He no. did. Get, he got tossed. Was it the day before he got tossed? Then it might have been the day before. I was watching. The, it wasn't during the day game. I thought he was going to, but he went out there and was given the umpire the business. And I think the umpire knew that he was in the wrong, so he didn't toss service. Yeah, no, he got tossed the right. day before though. Did he? I didn't see that one. Yeah, the first game he came back because he missed time with COVID too. Yes, he did. Um, I he thought, by the back, way, Negron did a fantastic job. Negron anyway. did great. Um, anyway, but that first service. game back, so I, I guess we fast forward to the Tampa Bay series when you know where we're at now, close. Um, you know, we we can skip over Texas because Texas is very just. Texas is easy. Texas is easy wins right now. Everything um, everything happened against Texas that I was expecting to happen. Yeah, I won. I won five dollars. Yeah, that part of the week <laughs> because yes. everything happened that I thought was going to happen. Yeah, and then over the weekend <laughs> we absolutely saw Ty France explode against KC. Yes, he did. He we tore the Ty cover Fran- off the ball, and you know I was a little peeved at this that he was named co-offensive player of the week of the American League but simply Miguel because hit three thousand. Miggy hit three thousand exactly right. I told Brig, I was like, Miggy could have gone one for eighty. That one hit having been his three thousandth hit. And he still would have been player of the week. Yeah, he it just yeah. happened to be happened the to be the same week that, that Ty France absolutely Ty France demolished the baseball out of his mind. Um, so then they beat the Rangers two to three. Probably going to be a pretty common occurrence in those three game series. Swept or, the Royals. Swept the Royals, which again probably is going to be a common occurrence for them happening. I don't know. Um, they struggle against the Royals. Like historically, last year the Royals were a pest in Seattle, especially Salvi Perez. They kept oh, him. Perez is a pest. They kept him from causing too much damage and and minimized it with solo home runs instead of grand slams. Like last year, it was grand slams on back to back days. Yeah. So I'm fine if Salvi's hitting hitting solo shots. Um, I got to tell you real quick though that Saturday game. So I put I put a few dollars on that game because they got up early, got up five to one early, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I I checked. I think it was FanDuel is what I was using that night. And I was like, oh sweet, I got pretty good odds at the Mariners minus four and a half. I was like, I just need one more run and things to hold. The bullpen should be fine. Couldn't have been more wrong. The Royals come back, and I was like, ah well, you know, you win some, you lose some. And then that Ty France home run covered for me. I was in the kitchen doing wow. dishes, and I was just <laughs> cracking up. I was like, holy <laughs> moly, <laughs> that never happens. Yeah, no, the Ty back France. door cover. <laughs> <laughs> he's an, been on an insurance home run in the that eighth one inning. two punch Frazier, um, Ty France. That that one two punch in the middle of the infield, though, looking real nice, too. JP's got to get his throws under control, but other he than does. that, but JP turning the double play Frazier, with Frazier and, looking nice. And do you yes. know they have some previous chemistry? They do. How where does that come from? So previous chemistry between Ty or Adam Frazier and J.P. Crawford, when J.P. Crawford was 20, they were both playing for the fall team for the Pirates. 
Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, because those fall teams, the Arizona Fall League teams, are like a collab, like a conglomerate of mm-hmm. of teams. Like they'll have like four four teams send guys to play. Yep. So yeah, and the then, Pirates and the Mariners. The Pirates and the Mariners are the uh, the Peoria Javelinas. Yeah. So it's them and the Padres. There's one more team I can't think off the top of my head, but that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So they played together a long time ago. I mean, because JP's what 27 now, so. Yeah. Seven years ago, Frazier's almost 30. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I hadn't thought about that. That's really cool. Yeah, it's a little fun fact for you Mariners fans out there. Um, and then we it. got the Tampa Bay. And I think what happened in Tampa Bay those last two games was, I mean, we got Kevin Cashed. Um, yeah. We got Kevin but, Cashed. But also, the, this the is Mariners the problem I have. So this is the problem impressive. I have with that series, though, is that last year the Mariners dominated the race. Oh, yeah. yeah start to finish all year mm-hmm. long. And by that, I mean, I think they played two series against each other. I think um, the Mariners went like five and six in those or something. Yeah, they uh, yeah won uh, six out of seven of those. Yeah. So that's obviously not going to happen this year. But um, it was just Tampa Bay pitching. Yeah. Shut everybody down. Yeah, it was just Kevin Cash being Kevin Cash and working mm-hmm. his analytics and just doing his – what should be two-time AL Manager of the Year award? There's that, yeah. But there were a couple times he'd made he made pitching changes, and he's known for making them a bat or two early. I was like, man, I wouldn't pull him out right here, but he did, and it worked out. Yeah, it worked out for him. And then also the Mariners were very aggressive in those games. They were not – I mean, they let Rasmussen just, like – they struck out on, like – most of his strikeouts were on three pitches. Yeah. Like they there did was not no have to play. There was none in those last two games. I mean, they were one run games, mm-hmm. nonetheless. But but that's because the Mariners pitching shut down the race just as much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But so in the um, I think it was the Thursday game. Yeah, Thursday because the one run came off this. Uh, Suarez hit a high fly ball out toward right field. Manuel Margot comes in to make the play on it, and he let it drop in front of him rather than sliding to try to make a catch or getting under it. Oh, and man. with that turf, the ball shot back up in the air, bounced over his head, and then kind of trickled towards the wall. And Suarez turned on the Jets yeah. after he rounded first and ran all the way around. Yeah. <laughs> it was outstanding. He dove into third, did a little flex, and did a little run with his fingers. It's like, yeah, dude, Twinkle Toe is getting around the bags. Love it. So yeah, much. <laughs> no, that was that was solid. And then yeah, I think the same thing almost happened to Kel- Kelnick too. In one of those games where it hit off a ring at the top of the trot, of course. Of course. Julio was right under it, and then all of a sudden you just see Julio go into a dead sprint, like forward, and uh-huh. barely make like a shoestring catch. It's crazy. It's not. It's the trot that place is such a mess. But let's let's get into. Uh, so today they open the series against the Marlins, and I I watched probably a little over half of this game. And uh, they looked sluggish, honestly. I'm surprised they scored six runs. Final score is eight to six. Um, I wasn't counting on that. We had to leave. Uh, my son had a baseball game, so we had to go. Um, but they put together a little rally in the third, in the in the ninth inning. We got we got production from Kelnick and Julio. Those guys are coming through when it matters. I just That's I just want to see. Their, I want to see it earlier. Exactly right. That's what, and that's right. what we talked about earlier. They're, they're still playing with their food. We want to see Julio get going earlier. We want to see Kelnick get going earlier because Kelnick, man, the dude, the, the things that we've seen from him, it's aggravating when he strikes out the way he does. Mm-hmm. Right? Because some of those strikeouts are ugly. He's swinging at a, at a breaking ball at his back foot. It's like, dude, let it go. Yeah, the discipline just go. escapes him. It does. And I get it. He's anxious. And there are times where we're going to be like, yeah, I'll take that strikeout in the second inning if I'm getting what I'm getting from him in the seventh. You know? Yeah, but... I mean, he's still getting there. He's getting there. He's getting on base. Like, they're coming in later in the game, mm-hmm. which is what you do want to see from young players, that they have the ability to be clutch. Mm-hmm. You know? they yeah. So that's good that they can thrive in those moments, that they're, like, trying in those moments. You know, and that they're trying to come through. I yeah. personally think Julio's doing too much in those moments, though. Yeah, he's trying. I, I he, do think that's part of it, is that he's pressing. 
he right. Is. Like he and has he, a plate discipline, which is good, but he's pressing. He's pressing, and so he's striking out, and he just wants to hit that first big league home run. He so needs to get out. He needs to bad. He needs, he needs to get it out of the way. Out of the system. He just <laughs> that's all he wants. He just needs yeah. a cookie, and he just needs a, a he just needs to be the cookie monster and just. Yeah, that's what Unload. he's trying to do late in games because he knows yeah. that there's a count where he's going to get the fastball. Yeah, and I think there were a couple times too in spring when he was he was trying to do too much because he had a mm-hmm. couple games like the game we went to. He had four four Ks, and it was like mm, I think you're trying too hard, man. I think at that point he was kind of like I'm really trying to make the club, but then he went on. He had like three days in a row where it was outstanding, and then you know they announced it and everything. But yeah, uh, but no, he does feel like he's pressing at the plate a little bit. But the other thing too, though, is every th- this is something that big league pitchers do, right? They they know a guy like Julio can hit the fastball. It's like, okay, can you hit my breaking ball? Probably not, because it's not like anything you've ever seen before in your life, except for in spring training, and you didn't yeah. even see that many of them. No, no, he didn't, and he's. I mean, I mean, even Cal make the same can be same for him. He's picking it up a little bit better. Yeah, breaking ball and whatnot. There have um, been at bats where he doesn't see a single fastball. But they don't it's all off speed. They don't hit the same like, like I feel like in the minors they're not as focused on like spin rates and all that stuff. They're just focused on winning and working out their individual mechanical issues. A lot like, of to- a lot of what I've what I learned when I was uh, working for. A rookie league team mm-hmm. a lot of the minor leagues is working out the mentality because you get guys who get into a major mess and you're like okay pull them but then it's like no they're not going to because they want to see how they handle it yeah a lot of it is working on the mental part of the game especially the guys who are really good you're like oh yeah he's a big league pitcher but let's see how he handles bases loaded with nobody out yeah can he no. get out of it can he make his pitches still or is he going to walk guys around so yeah, no, that makes sense. And I mean that's a lot of the reason why we saw Cal Raleigh get sent down. Yeah. That's yeah, he, he could not hit the breaking he breaking. He wasn't stuff. hitting it, he wasn't picking it up. I feel like yeah. he wasn't as good behind the plate. He was better this year than he was last year. He wasn't as good last year. Um, I feel like he's he started the season better than he than what he showed last year okay but his bat was worse i mean i still think they need to make him choose a side of the plate i think so too no i think that's a big thing and i think i don't know i watch his defense his framing was fine his pitch calling fine yeah but his throws on like stealing bases just did not look like not as sharp there's not as sharp murphy's look sharp even terenz's look sharp murphy looks like a completely different person oh yeah terenz does too if we're going to talk about anyone on this team as a surprise, let's talk about Tom. Yeah. Tom My Murphy's goodness. like the best hitter in the world right now. Yeah. They actually brought him in to pinch hit for Jared Kelnick uh, against the Rays the other day. And Last, first yeah. off, I was shocked. But the other time, at the other hand, I was like, if you're going to do it, <laughs> now's the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Might, might as well. It was crazy. And such a bizarre world because I was so done with Tom Murphy after last season. And I get it. Guys have bad seasons, but man, he's legitimately a different person. Terence is a completely different person. He made today. He made the most heads up play I've ever seen him make as a defensive player on the field. Uh, he he. They had first and third. He called the play. Had Soler on third, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I don't remember who was running on first, but he took off, and Terence just jumped up and fired it to second, just straight up. He didn't even give the runner a chance. Because he was giving himself up, right? There were yeah. two outs. He's giving. He was trying to get into a pickle so that Solaire could score. But I think what he had called was a throw through to second, but a throw back to home. And Solaire held up for just long enough. For I think it was Adam Frazier had the ball. He ran the runner about halfway back with it with his eye on Solaire the whole time. Wasn't even paying attention to the runner, just as a formality, running him back. And then he threw it home. They had Solaire by twenty feet. It was That's great. Fantastic quarterbacking by Terence. I only was. Thing that drives me crazy so about Terence is his gear. Because I why I just can't stand his catcher's gear. Because he <laughs> wears like the bulky gear, and then he sets up in the one knee stance. And <laughs> he's only six feet tall, so he just looks real small. And then he was. 
He... His nickname on MLB.com is Churro. That's funny. I like that. I'm, I'm down for that. But, like, I just can't stand how he just looks. I just don't like how he, like, how his body looks. and like he fits the on the wears. baseball field? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's he's six foot. He's a six foot 217 catcher. I didn't know he was a second overall pick. Um, I didn't know that either. Didn't know yeah, that. by the of course it's by the red. So you know, did you? Okay, I don't think you watched the game today, but that makes a whole lot more sense. Terenza's height because watching him stand next to Jacob Stallings today, the catcher for the for the Marlins, he's six five. Terenza looked like a little kid. Yeah, Terenza's tiny. He's like Altuve size. <laughs> he looked Altuve size standing next yeah. to Stallings. I was like, okay, I'm which so one he... of those dudes is tall? Which one is small? I I can't tell. <laughs> His gear makes him look like a little kid. He does. And you know what else is funny is um, Tom Murphy, I think, changed his mask this year. And and so the helmet, the, but the but the face mask, the way that it's the way that it's built is uh-huh. it's it juts out from the helmet. So if the ball hits the mask, it's not technically hitting the helmet. Because Terence, his his mask is inlaid into his into his goalie helmet, right? Yeah, he he but, wears the goal, goalie style. Yeah, and so does Murphy. Murphy wears one too, but his the mask part, like the wire framing, uh-huh. is external. Oh, it looks okay. like a little league mask. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It, it's funny to see because like it looks like a little league thing. But, yeah. Okay, so we've highlighted everything we talked a little bit about today. Um, like I said, late rally came up short. Let's let's talk about our best and worst of the month. What was the let's let's start negative and then we'll we'll go positive so we can end on a good note. I what was the say, worst thing you saw in May? Uh, the worst thing I saw in May was, I mean, I hate to say it, but it would be the back of the rotation between flexing between. Flexen and Brash. Like I I like Brash. Don't get me wrong. I think the potential right. is there. I just don't because he went straight from double A to the majors. He didn't spend any time in triple A. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, which is what the Mariners are notorious for. Like double A is your last stop as a pitcher. Well, we it, was like the last, it was the last it was the last stop for Julio. Yeah. It was the last it's stop. Like, well, it wasn't the last stop for Kelnick, but no. Um, but that's honestly that's a normal thing. Because yeah. if you look, if you look at the organization of the minor league system and like how it's how it's set up, is mm-hmm. that what you'll find is that Double A is meant to be the elite level, whereas Triple A is veterans and, and like cooler major league ready depth. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, your, it's your big league depth, but the Double A that's where the talent is, because that that's that's sense. really that where you're like sense. getting your guys like okay. This is where you're going to get ready for the big league. So it makes sense that these guys are coming straight from Double A. It's just that they're not facing veteran hitters. Is the yeah. difference? And that so could that's be all that's the what difference. I would say would would probably be would probably be Matt Brash has been very disappointing. Just like the control issues, and it's yeah. been it's it been hard for today. me to get excited for Matt Brash. There's flashes, but it's they're not like it's not like Logan Gilbert last year, where it was like. And, Holy crap. So I had I actually I actually had that thought today. It's funny you say that. And you know, it kind of works out because Brash pitched today. But I was like, you know, Logan Gilbert looked good his first few outings, but they didn't mm-hmm. go well. Right? It took him probably no, yeah. three it took him probably three outings before the team started like because like it got to a point where it's like, okay, if Logan Gilbert's on the mound, the team is winning today, right? And yeah. I think it was three or four outings. Today was Brash's third third start. It's time for him to settle in, and he's going to look like a rookie. We know that. He's going to look like a rookie at times this year. But it's time for him to shake off the jitters and settle in and be the guy who started against the White Sox. And really, I mean, he worked them over. Aside from like one or two bad pitches, that was a great start. That was an outstanding start to his season against the White Sox. So I I am expecting to see that from him coming up. But yes, he has been disappointing compared to what we thought he could be right out the yeah. gate. Um, my worst has to be everything away from T Mobile. They've got to learn how to play on the road. They've got to learn how to play on the road. So far, they're I mean, 
It's only ten games away, but they're four and six on the road, seven and two at home. Yeah, that's it. That's a disparity that that they're gonna have to even out because if you can't win games on the road, you sure as heck better be darn near perfect at home. Yeah, no, for if real. you're gonna make playoffs. And I think this team can make the playoffs. They just gotta figure out how to win on the road. Yeah, no, I I would agree with that. I would agree with that hundred percent. So that's been my biggest frustration so far as anything away from T-Mobile. What was the best thing you saw in uh, in April? The best thing I saw in April, I don't know. I love the combination of the French, the Fraser France, like the one-two punch. I love Ty France in that two hole. It gives me very, 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 very similar to a now retired third baseman of the Mariners who used to thrive in the two hole really strong after a good leadoff hitter when Kyle Seeger was young and he was coming up and Ichiro was still there. Mm -hmm. That was an insane one, two punch. Very similar to Ty France. It is because Ty France, um, he has the same kind of power Seeger did. Yeah. On the other side of the plate. Yeah, you're right. That's an excellent, that is an excellent comparison. And Ty France is right-handed so he doesn't get shifted. As much. He does. It's it's just it's a different kind of shift, but he's not going to yeah. deal with that next year anyway. But it's not it's not as extreme though as Kyle Seager's yeah. was. Like the left, yeah, the shift for left-handers is extreme because you can because the first baseman is part of it. You can't you can only shift to first baseman so far. Yeah. So yeah, and yeah. There is there is France that can still spray the ball. He doesn't just hit one field. He he sprays. So yeah, he does. That's probably been my absolute favorite thing is that one too. Yeah, I like that. Um. One of my favorite things has been Adam Frazier. I think I texted you and said I'm in love with Adam Frazier because all he yes, does is get on base yep, and score yep. runs. Yep. Yeah, that's been one of them. But the other big thing that I've loved to see this month is Julio Rodriguez still in bases. He got another one today, by the way. I forgot to check before we came on. Yep. Got another one. So he's nine for nine on stolen bags. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he could lead the league. Yeah. At this and, and it's just another point to what you're saying, like the timing things and the eye and like. The time you can tell he spent watching film, working with coaches, is all there. It's mm-hmm. all there. It is that I because if you watch him, there's times they'll show that camera that shows the pitcher and the for and and first base, right? Mm-hmm. When you're watching the game, uh, that's my favorite camera angle, and he's on base because you obviously you see him go, but it's not just the fact that he's stealing bases; he's getting phenomenal jumps on these pitchers. Yeah. And he knows exactly not, when to go on these guys. And but the great thing about that is like I've seen those same clips and he's not like like when D Gordon would be on first base. Uh-huh. He moved a lot. Julio's mm-hmm. very calm. Like he's, he's not quiet. getting he's not getting your attention. He's just yeah. like as a pitcher, especially a right-handed pitcher, it's like okay, I know he's over there, but like one of the things though I think is it's because D was so small. That he almost like he almost had to to like get himself revved up, and I think if Julio was over there jumping around, that's a lot of body to move back and forth. That's you know? true. But I think <laughs> that he's going to get picked if he's bouncing around. <laughs> but that's also to his advantage, though, is that he's he's disciplined. He's very very yeah. disciplined. He is he is way more disciplined than I would expect anybody his age to be. I'll give him that. Like yeah. everywhere on the baseball field, so yeah, much at twenty one. Yeah, it's outstanding. And only with 19 big league games under his belt so far, he came out. He came up way more mature than I would have expected him to be. Yeah, he came up more ready than mm-hmm. Kelnick did. And that's and... the thing that's crazy is we swore Kelnick was ready. Oh yeah, because he was all... tearing the cover off the ball at AAA, and yeah. he came up. He hit a home run his second game. It's like, oh yeah, here he is, and then he goes oh for 40. And it's like, oh no, he's not yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, it's I don't know. I think Kelnick's gonna come around. You see it, we see what he's capable of. And when he hits the ball hard, there are times it just is right into the shift right at somebody. Yeah, he does it's he the same thing with Winker. Right where they're at. So Winker is I think a bloop and a bomb away from breaking out of this slump. And I mean we we got the bloop, we got the walk off bloop against the Royals. We just need the bomb. And he yeah. hit one foul into the third deck in in Miami today. Yeah, he's so, crush. So he's, you put him in there yeah. against righties. He's he's like one of the best right-handed hitters in baseball. 
Well, he's a lefty, but yeah, I know. Well, I know what you're saying. Yeah, he, he against hits right-handed righties. pitchers. Yeah, yeah, against yeah, yeah. But no, I just want to clarify that for the listeners. Okay, uh, last thing we have here: What do you want to see from this team in May? Ooh. I want to see George Kirby. Oh, in I place of who? I don't know. You pick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to find it earlier. I can't find a diagnosis for Marco. It's a contusion, like, a wrist contusion. He says he's going to make his next start. Yeah, well, he shouldn't. They should just... <laughs> take some time off. Let take an take extended vacation. Yeah, let him take some time. No, I would. I want George Kirby on this team because Kirby is absolutely lights out at AA. He's like really he, good. He got shelled in his last or second to last outing in spring training, and that's why he didn't make the club. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, I don't. I feel like Marco has not been consistent since his wife had that baby. Yeah, I don't, I'm not blaming anybody. And... I'm not blaming anybody, no. but as a parent, I know how much sleep you get, and yeah, I think it's and affecting it could just him. Be just hard and just difficult trying to manage all this new aspect and stuff. So we don't it think about be. that. For that, these ball players are human beings. And exactly, they're, they're people. They have athletes. lives off the field. Yeah, like they have children and families and lives. Like you said, like that's gonna affect them the same as it's gonna affect you and me. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I don't know. I don't know if if it is or if it's coincidence or what, or if it was just like, I mean, we saw because it was about halfway through the season last year that they had the baby, and 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 we saw Kikuchi fall off the second half of the season last year, and. He's doing all right in Toronto, but I don't. Marco seems like he hasn't gotten that that edge back. Mm-mm. You know, he was fine in that start against the Astros, but he had a lot of run support. Yeah, and he doesn't look as like that look. He used to have that look. He had that look. He doesn't look like he's having fun anymore. He doesn't look like he's having fun. Like the look's not there when he looks down to get the sign. Like it's just like yeah, yeah. Where's that edge? Yeah, that is that's what it is. The edge seems like it's gone. So he and Diego Castillo look like they're not having fun when they're pitching. They look like they're in the most stressful situation of their lives, which I get. You know, like I didn't like pitching because it was stressful, but these guys do it for a living. So yeah, <laughs> look a little less stressed, please. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I says agree. the guy I, from his computer chair. Exactly. Yeah, two guys from their computer chairs. <laughs> One thing I also want to see more of in May. I want to see more of this Penn Murphy kid. Okay. I haven't had a chance to watch him. I didn't get to watch him. He was good. He's really good. Like he, he he went through the whole system. You know, he, he was a 2018, 30, 30, 33rd round pick. Um, I recognize the name. I'll, I'll tell you that much. And he's just been, you know, crawling up the minors the last few years. He was in AAA. He was absolutely lights out at AAA. Like he Mm. dominated AAA from a relief standpoint. He finally got a shot today after being selected, not pitched, sent down, called back up the next day. <laughs> um, and he had he went two innings pitched uh, with two Ks. And I just want to see what more of these bullpen arms and more of these arms that we have that are ready but not being, like, looked at, you know? Yeah. I think Murphy has a chance to be here to stay. Um, because Johan Ramirez got sent down. Um, he got sent down. I think I think Murphy might get to keep his spot if he continues to pitch this way. Devoto really likes Ramirez. I think <laughs> I he does. I think he really likes Festa. He does like Festa. I've and heard him talk Festa about Matt Festa. Got, and he likes gave up him. two runs again today. Festa did not have an outstanding. Didn't do well today. But no, no. He I the eighteen strikeouts and ten innings. I mean, it's like ah, oh, man. Yeah. But so the thing that I want to see, Jewel, the thing that I want to see in May is I want to see a healthy Mitch Haniger. Um, so there's the COVID thing, right? Like you can't fault a guy. I did think it was interesting because like I think the NBA, I know the NFL has dropped their COVID protocols. I don't think they're even testing anymore. No, I don't they're think just the NBA like, is. If you get sick, you get sick, you know, <laughs> like, and then you're out. There's your spot. MLB, yeah, MLB, like – um, like service was out, Haniger was out, and uh, Manny Acta was out. The third base coach was out. So I want to say that's because like the MLB still has to deal with the international protocols. 
It could be well. it. Like yeah. the NFL and the NBA aren't dealing with that international pro. Well, the, the NBA is. They have a team in Toronto. Yeah, but I mean, that's true. But they're in the playoffs, so they're not going to say, oh, the well, tr- sorry. Toronto was just playing the other day. I know, but, they they're, but they're in the playoffs, so they're going to. Yeah, that's yeah, You're right. You're right. <laughs> Make money. You're right. But no, and then and then Hanniger today, his first game back, he smokes a single and then he hobbles to first base. Like, yeah, oh I gosh, I'm like, I just guy. want this dude to stay healthy. Like, but like he was with the team in Tampa. Yeah. I, I think he was cleared to play, but he wasn't feeling up to playing. Like he wasn't. Yeah, I don't well think he was like, Yeah, I don't think he was feeling because good. if have you had the privilege yet, Jewel, of getting COVID? <laughs> I okay. So this is gonna be a <laughs> For the listeners, okay. So I don't think I've had COVID, but when I got my first COVID shot, okay, it was a few weeks after my separation. Uh huh. And it was a celebratory night after work because (laughs) this was April 20, it's probably like May 2021. The bars are just starting to open back up. Uh Yeah, yeah. So a group of friends of mine went down to the bar the same day that morning. I just got my COVID booster. Felt great. Went to work. Felt fine. Had many, many rounds of shots that night. Probably, oh, shots. I think we had five rounds, and then I had two ciders, and I did not drive myself home um, because, you know, make sure you guys always designate a DD. Um, <laughs> but I, that night, I had night sweats. I had a fever of like 103. I was awful. I had all this stuff. I'm like, okay, I think I can check the box that I had COVID for <laughs> overnight. So, so I had it. I did get it. I got it from my daughter. She brought it home from her autism therapy center. And um, I was down and out, not functional for about 36 hours, but I was Ooh. sick for about six weeks after that. Like just, I felt like crap for six weeks. So I could see Hanniger, you know, Coming back, being clear to play, and just been like, I still feel like garbage. Yeah, no, I get you that. Know? My my daughter had it too, and then after she had it, I had a cough for like I was just that like, might have been it right there, and had a cough that for been weeks, weeks. Yeah. I was like, this is not going away. Yeah, I I actually went to the doctor. I was like, I think I have a sinus infection because I could feel it, and it was making me cough. She's like, No, you're still dealing with the after effects of COVID. She's like, You're you're okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you yeah <laughs> made it through. But uh, but no, I want to see a healthy Mitch Hanniger. Um, and, you know, he may have just tweaked something today. We haven't heard anything back yet yeah. on what happened. It may have just been a tweak because he was off for a few days. And if he st- and that's, that's the problem. If he, you step out of the box wrong, right? Yeah. I think it was just like a, a rolled ankle is what they said right away. Oh, that's good. And Rick, I was listening to the radio at the time. And Rick Riz was just distraught. Yeah, like, totally. absolutely. Just, he's just, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, no, same. And I'm just like immediately into a deep depression. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and that's what's funny. Like when, okay, now we've seen it twice, and I don't think it's a coincidence because that April 16th game, Hanniger was announced out. They lose 0-4. Today he goes out in the second. They lose 8-6 and can't rally back until the end of the game. He plays a significant role on this team. We've seen yeah. it. We know that he does. And they need him to be healthy if they're going to make the playoffs. Because despite the success that this team had on that home stand without him, it's not going to happen if he's not there in the long term. No, and they need him. Because you need, you need to have that bat. You need to have good bats coming off the bench. Because as deep as as deep as we think this team is, you need to have consistency with that depth. Yeah. No, and agree, ha- having I mean... Hanniger in the starting lineup – gives you Toro as your first option off the bench. And Toro as the first option off the bench is better than probably what 25 teams have coming off their bench as their first option. Yeah, because then our first option goes to Demo off the bench. Or... As much, and I love me some Demo. Yeah. But he is not my first choice off the bench. No. <laughs> Hammer and Tom Murphy is my first choice off the bench these days. Exactly. And, exactly. and he's starting because there's no more Cal Raleigh right now. Yeah. And Torrens, you know, right matchup, maybe. Um, but you know, that probably drive, gives us to our, our last question is, you know, one thing that we both could see in May. Potentially. Potentially. I don't know that it necessarily will, but we could see Kyle Lewis coming back. And that 
brings so many questions and so many elements. I just wrote about this on the blog piece that's coming out a little bit later, but this Mariners outfield is a, a beautiful disaster. <laughs> that's a perfect way to put it. <laughs> because Wink is under contract through 2024. Hanniger is a free agent at the end of the season. You have six, the next six years of control over Julio. Julio you have five Kalnick more over five, Kalnick. Right? Yeah. And you have three more over Kyle Lewis. Um, so you have a guarantee, you have guaranteed four years of those, of those three. Um, but then you have two very important veterans one that's probably the heart and soul of your entire team right now. One of two guys. I would put Hanniger and Crawford as yeah. co-captains of this team. Like, they're the faces of the franchise. Yeah. And yeah. we see what happens when Mitch Hanniger starts and then leaves or isn't yep. there. Yep. And they're not at home. Yep. And yep. we problem. see how important it is for Jesse Winker's bat, too. Well, the, the thing with Winker is that he strug- like, he's had his struggles, is that he hasn't been getting hits, and most of it's been unlucky because he just, like, he lined into a triple play. That's true. That doesn't happen. But, but does know? he, but does that, but, is that better when you have, when you know that some of the pressure might be off of you? If he's hitting three and Hanager's coming up at four? Yeah, and exactly. Three, and that's the and thing is that. already on base? And that's what I was going to say is that despite Winker's struggles and, like I said, being unlucky, he's been able to come through when it matters. He yeah. hit that walk off. He had a big walk. He had a big single. He had a sack fly when he needed it. Um, but I do think that there will be some pressure taken off of him with Hanniger batting and four the, behind him. Yeah, and that's the difference. That's a 1,000% difference. Because because I've been sold on Suarez. Eugenio Suarez has has won me over 100% this first month of the season. That I might agree. be my big surprise. But I would love to have somebody more consistent with putting the ball in play with Mitch Hanniger and have Suarez at five. Yeah. Well, Daddy JP's at five, okay? Well, Daddy JP needs to be like... That's the thing that's hard, is that I want JP higher in the lineup, but there's yeah, nowhere I want, to put him. <laughs> I want him at three. Because things are working. Things are working. It's Winker worked. is a like, Winker is a three. Winker Winker's is a three. three. That's where he, he belongs. And you have to have Frazier and France one, two. Because it's working. it's working. It's working. Crawford's not really a four kind of guy. I don't know. Maybe you put Suarez at seven. Put Julio at six. Suarez at seven. Kalnick at eight. And then whoever's catching at nine. <laughs> That's a well, pretty good trip to the bottom of the order. Unless, unless, unless Hanniger's hurt, then you put Murph at four. I don't think you put Murph at four. I mean, you I think could. you keep. I think you keep Suarez at four. Yeah, I think. No, I think they're doing that right with what they have. Is that you've got to you've got to keep Suarez at yeah. four. I think that Suarez that's, was hitting four after Wink. Yeah, yeah, and then it's Crawford or put Crawford at four and Suarez at five, because. Uh, the higher you move Crawford up in the order, the better he does. Yeah, no, agreed. And you put him at four, knowing that likelihood is there's going to be one to three base runners. Yeah. Crawford's a bona fide all-star at that point. <laughs> well, he's on like a nine-game hitting streak right now. Yeah, but you put guys in front of him instead of always having to debate if he's either going to lead off or yeah. have two outs and be in crappy situations. But you set him up and he's going to. Yeah, but the big question we have that we we got to, but we kind of got off topic with, was what do you do with the outfield? What do we do with the outfield? Who's the odd man out? Because there's gonna be somebody who's the odd man out. It's you can't Kelnick. have five it's, outfielders. It's Kelnick. Today it is. It's Yesterday Kelnick. it was. Tomorrow I don't. I mean, really, I think you're right. I think that there's no other option. It has to be Kelnick. But I do you send him down or do you trade him? You trade him. Back to the Mets. For Edwin Diaz. <laughs> For Edwin Diaz. <laughs> He's a free agent. Undo the trade. As long I mean, as they keep Robbie Cano, I'm good. Yeah, no, they can keep him. Um, but no, honestly, like there's a lot of really good talent out there that what do you, you know, get? Do you try to get a back of the order, the a back of the rotation starter, or do you try to get some relievers? What no, you, you get, get a bat. A bat? You get a You've bat. got bats. You've got you bats. You're already another, crowded with bats. Get another bat. Go get Trey Mancini. Oh shoot! 
But then what do you do with Ty France? You keep Ty France and you have Trey Mancini. Do what? Greatness. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you Mancini's not coming off the bench. You can't have that guy come off the bench. You could have him DH, but you've already got four outfielders rotating through the DH position. I was about to say you could have him play left, but then you got Kyle, Lewis will probably, Kyle Lewis will probably have to play left and Maybe. Wink with DH. I th- I honestly think Kyle Lewis is going to come back in DH. Yeah, well, He'll spend the rest start, of the yeah. season as the DH just to help that knee. Probably. But, I mean, there's... No, I, mean, there's I, think, I think you trade for a back-of-the-rotation starter or a closer. Yeah. As much as I love Steckenrider, Seawald, and Crew... I think I think if you have a closer in addition to those guys, you're playing seven inning games every single stinking day. And that's why I said go to the Mets and get Diaz. Diaz, get him back. Yeah. Like I think that happens next offseason. I think they resign. You think they resign Diaz? I think they resign Diaz. I don't know if they'll be able to pay him enough money, honestly. Well, they will. I mean, he'll probably ask for Kenley Jansen money, but. Yeah, I don't know if I would give him Kenley Jansen money. The problem with closers, though, we've talked about, I don't know if we've talked about this before. I know Brig and I have, is that you don't know what you're going to get year over year with closers. Like True. Craig Kimbrell just has straight up forgotten how to close games since yeah. he was traded from the Cubs. True. Like you, he's a guy who, before, like two years ago, was like, yes, we want Kimbrell. And now you're like, uh, keep him, keep him in the bullpen today because we don't want him to blow this. Okay. Well, what about this trade? This is just one more trade scenario because I know we're getting close. We tra- it's a trade to the Mets again. Involves Kelnick. And this is definitely a homer thing, but Taiwan Walker is oh, a player God. option. Hasn't looked awful. Again, another back of the rotation kind of guy who's pitched in Seattle, which can right. do that can play really well late in the season, mm-hmm. knowing where you're at. Yeah. Edwin Diaz, trade Kelnick, and I don't know who someone else probably probably have to they probably up. want like a suarez they probably want a suarez probably want like a suarez or i mean i could honestly which i'd be fine with because we've got toro who's more consistent yeah toro you could probably also probably swing dylan moore in there oh, man. you know you know there's sheffield there's, dylan there's moore is my it, dylan moore is my current willie bloomquist oh, yeah <laughs> i mean we gotta have one of those but still i'm just saying the possibilities there for <laughs> those kind of trades or, you know, there's a possibility to bring in a Xander Bogart at the trade deadline. Oh my gosh. Don't you toy with my emotions. There's a possibility of bringing I don't in think, trades. I don't think that the Red Sox are ever going to get it rid, do anything ever to part with Xander Bogarts. But man, if they asked for Kyle Lewis and Jared Kelnick, I would do it in a second. And I love me some Kyle Lewis so much. Yeah. And I do like Jared Kelnick. Don't get me wrong, but if he could fetch, a Xander Bogarts, dude. I mean, there's, come on I now. Mean, there's a lot. Of I don't think it would ever happen, though. I really don't think the Red Sox would ever let him go. No, I mean, but he has a player option, so he's out of there at the end of the season because he's only getting paid twenty mil. They what if they pay him? They're not over the luxury. They're not over no, the. No, I mean, they definitely could, but threshold. I'm just saying, like, there's there's guys they could, like that. They there's could give like... him. The, this is the thing the Red Sox could do. This is one of the last things we're going to say here, and then we got to wrap up. Yeah, they they could give him a five to six year deal and trade him in four years. They could easily do that, 100%, unless yeah. he has a, and and even if he has a no trade clause, they can be like, we will let you curate the trade, and we'll make it happen. Yeah, no, I, I don't. Agree, I man. don't think they're going to sell him off just because he has that player option. Honestly, yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of interesting names. I mean, I'm sure we can talk about that come May, June. Um, yeah, definitely a conversation we can have in up. July, for sure, going into July. Because yeah. I think that this team, I think they're going to have to make a move. Um, they have to, to especially if Kalu comes back strong. Down the stretch, yeah, especially down the stretch, because um, Jerry Depoto is going to be looking at moves to make to take this team from playoff contenders to playoff participants. 
yeah, playoff and winners. It happens with the ro- back happen of the rotation, and it happens with the bullpen for sure. Yeah, exactly. That's why I think that that's the move that you make. But baseball family, thank you again for joining us on the couch this month. We really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been the Seattle Baseball Together podcast. Don't forget to jump on the shop 9plusus.com, spell it out, N-I-N-E-P-L-U-S-U-S dot com, and use code, I keep forgetting to say this, use code CPOD, S-E-A-P-O-D. D that will get you 15% off the entire Seattle collection. Uh, there is a link to that collection down in the description of every single episode for you. Uh, heads up. I I'm just gonna tell you this right now. We're going to be doing some, uh, remodeling, I guess you could say on the shop, on the website, but things are going to, so things are going to start looking a little bit different here in the next coming months, but it's going to be cleaner and crisper and you're going to love, I'm sure you're just, you're going to love what we have there, but hop on over there and uh, take a look at some of the Seattle collection. And uh, again, that's CPOD, S-E-A-P-O-D for 15% off. And that's good for as many times as you want it to be. Jewel, tell us about your blog. Okay. I like it. Picasso. Um, (laughs) So we got the ballboy blog, the ballboyblog.com actually just underwent a makeover. Um, You did. A total makeover with, um, thumbnails and colors and we have three new affiliate sponsors um, that are going to be blasted all over my Instagram this week um, <laughs> to help you guys pick out those amazing Mother's Day gifts um, so head over to the Ball Boy blog on Instagram you'll see some great promotions with Mrs. Fields and with Bissell to keep nice. it clean and to help your mom clean that house that she loves so much so <laughs> Until next month, baseball family, 